be opening the Hello, I'll be opening up the session in about one minute. So one minute till the start of our webinar. Thank you very much. That's perhaps 30 seconds, but I'm gonna go forward anyway. <laughs> Hello, uh, and welcome to this evening's Imagine Austin Speaker Series webinar. It's called Project Connect, Ask Me Anything. My name is Kathleen Fox, and I work for the City of Austin's Housing and Planning Department, and I manage the Imagine Austin Speaker Series. Um, Imagine Austin Speaker Series at its core is about the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan which is the city of Austin's 25 year uh, plan for the future. And this speaker series is to promote uh, um, mutual, mutual learning and shared dialogue through this event, which is usually done via a presentation followed by a question and answer section. Um, so every year, we, held, we hold several meetings a year and uh, inviting thought leaders and speakers both locally and nationally to give talks in a variety of fields, including land use, mobility, housing, public health, social equity, sustainability, the creative economy, again, a variety of subjects, a variety of speakers. Today's sponsors for this webinar are Capital Metro and the City of Austin's Project Connect office. Our speakers this evening are Anique Boudet, Lonnie Stern, and Peter Mullen. Anique currently serves as the city's mobility officer. She leads the team at the City of Austin's Project Connect office, which will support the Austin Transit Partnership and Capital Metro to implement Project Connect projects. Anique also led, uh, led the update for the city's multimodal transportation plan. She also led the strategic uh, Austin Strategic Mobility Plan and was the co-lead for the city's land development code revision. Uh, Anique has over 20 years experience in land use and transportation planning, has worked in a variety of departments in a variety of roles. Lonnie Stern currently serves as the manager of business and community partnerships for Austin Transit Partnership. He previously served as a community engagement administrator for Capital Metro. Uh, as a senior director at SkillPoint Alliance, as an outreach director at Empower Texans, as a communications director at Hope Street Group, and as the executive director at Aglyph Film Festival. Peter Mullen is the chief of architecture and urban design at Austin Transit Partnership, where he is responsible for delivering the opportunities of Project Connect to enhance Austin's diverse and human-centered urban fabric through architecture, landscape design, urban design, public art, and community engagement. Engagement, excuse me. Prior to working at ATP, Peter served as the CEO of Waterloo Greenway, and he also played a lead role for the City of New York uh, Highline, which I know a lot of people have heard about that. He is also a licensed architect and received his architecture degree at Yale University. For housekeeping items, uh, we will be recording this event. The event after the event within a week will be posted on the Imagine Austin Speaker Series website where we keep all of our speaker series. Um, let's see. Questions for, as far as talking, the only ones that are allowed to talk are the panelists. And if you have any questions, you can use the Zoom question and answer widget. And again, we love questions. And that's the whole meaning of this is to a mutual learning and understanding. Um, our format this evening is approximately a 35 minute presentation followed by question and answers. Um, after the presentation, we will be sending you a link in the chat uh, or the Q&A section to do the survey. Please fill out the survey because we not only 
want to know how we're doing, but um, you to give us suggestions for future speakers and future topics. And with that, I'm kicking it off to Anik Baudet, who will do the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen, um, Lonnie, and Peter for joining um, together here this evening to talk about Project Connect and Imagine Austin. So um, I'm going to start uh, by giving um, an overview of the city's role and the connection, um, the, the city's role in Project Connect and um, the connection from a planning perspective between Imagine Austin and, and Project Connect. So next slide. All right, so what is the City of Austin Project Connect office? Well, the City of Austin Project Connect office is, represents the city's role in a tri-agency approach to implementation of the projects within the Project Connect portfolio. So Project Connect is, yes, it's light rail, but it's also bus rapid transit, Metro Rapid, it's a lot of other projects. And but Cat Metro, the Austin Transit Partnership and the City of Austin all have critical roles in delivering all of those projects within the program. And so the City of Austin Project Connect Office represents that support. We are a small office. We are located in the Management Services Department because our reach needs to be organization, organizationally wide in that we are working with many of our 40 plus departments that um, have a stake in Project Connect from utilities to housing and planning. Uh, transportation, public works, um, and a lot in between economic development. Um, can't name them all. I, I, my joke is that I'm going to try to find a way for animal services to be involved with Project Connect, but I haven't found that connection yet. But we are a small art office, and we are basically, um, you know, an ombudsman, an advocate for assuring that Project Connect is being implemented. Um, per the sequence plan and, and the timeline that was approved with the contract with the voters, but also while upholding all of our city policies and all of the goals within Imagine Austin, bringing it back to Imagine Austin. Um, we have a lot of mobility goals, we have environmental goals, we have public health goals. And so how do we implement such a large scale capital program while being true to who we are as Austinites and what we've developed in our comprehensive plan? So our mission um, at the City of Austin Project Connect office is to connect communities by supporting the delivery of the city's high, high capacity oops, in the way, transit system with a focus on collaboration, innovation, technical ex excellence, and efficiency. And I will highlight innovation and collaboration, and that's really the space we've been in um, over the last year. And, and it's almost the year anniversary of the of the. Um, referendum that passed the $7 billion. So that is really exciting. Next slide. So our office, like I said, is a small office. This is our leadership team. And I'll point out that um, most, uh, or our leadership team is made up of folks who have worked either at Capital Metro and have a lot of transit experience um, and at the city for a really long time. And so what we bring is the ability to hit the ground running with regards to utility coordination, permitting, um, and environmental aspects um, to support the Austin Transit Partnership and Capital Metro as they um, develop their, their the plans to implement Project Connect. Um, Leanne Conte is our Chief of Staff who also has a lot of transportation experience that she brings to the table. And so all of us are available. Um, we have an open door policy if anyone has any questions about the city's role um, in support of Project Connect. And I will mention, I know that Peter and Lonnie will mention this, but everybody knows that Capital Metro is our transit authority and you know, has been delivering transit services for multiple decades um, here in the city of Austin. The Austin Transit Partnership is a new, what we call local government corporation that was created by the city and Capital Metro specifically to implement Project Connect. So um, again, the tri-agency partnership is gonna be critical uh, as we all have a role. 
And I have a last slide where I'm going to talk about my passion as a planner, which is how Project Connect implements Imagine Austin. So one of, one of our um, goals and our vision for Imagine Austin is to have a mobile and interconnected city, an accessible city where our transportation network provides a wide variety of options that are efficient, reliable, and cost-effective, serving diverse needs and capabilities of our, of our citizens, our residents. We want the public and private sector to work together and to, to improve our air quality and reduce con congestion or manage congestion and do that in a collaborative way. Um, the Imagine Austin Comp plan called for us to create an Austin Strategic Mobility Plan, which we did in, in April of 2019 that was passed. And we did that planning process uh, in cooperation with Project Connect when it was in its early stages of high capacity transit planning. And where we ended was with a unanimous vote of city council to adopt the Austin Strategic Mobility Plan um, with the Project Connect vision plan embedded within it um, as a key component to reaching our 50-50 mode share goal, which is our bold vision for our transportation plan, where in 2039, 50% of us living in Austin drive alone if we have to, and the other 50% are walking because we have equitable TODs, we have Project Connect going, we have enhanced transit, we have carpooling, we have more opportunities to bike and more opportunities to walk. And so that vision um, is, is being implemented and it's really, really exciting. Um, so Project Connect um, succinctly in the last bullet supports the Imagine Austin Growth Concept Plan, as you can see on the map that many of our activity centers and our activity, activity corridors are touched by the Project Connect system plan. Uh, and we have funding for implementation. So that is a planner's dream. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Lonnie, I believe. Thank you. Thanks, Anit, for teeing us up um, and uh, for helping to place this in context with Imagine Austin. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. I'm Lonnie Stern, and I'm the manager of business and community partnerships for the Austin Transit Partnership. And um, today I'm gonna to start with, why are we talking about transit at all? Uh, we touched a little bit on the strategic mobility plan um, goal of moving to 50-50 mode split. And so you can see where we are today, where practically three quarters of all trips are by car and we're imagining moving to half and half. Uh, and certainly the Project Connect plan intends to increase transit um, as well as to some extent um, bicycle as well um, because of the bike share partnership that we have in place with Metro Bike. Now getting there is um, really the, the whole story and, and, and why are we trying to get there? We know as a region we keep doubling every 20 to 25 years and this next doubling is a whopper where we're going from two to four million people. And you're really gonna feel it when you realize that we have to move twice as many people through the same amount of space. And so it's really a ge geometry problem. How do we move more people on our streets? And so I offer you this slide for a sec, just to take a look at what 70 people look like on the road if they move in a bus, on a bike, or in cars. And just to be clear, if you do all this counting here of cars, you're gonna notice it's 30 something cars. I need another two blocks of space to move 70 people. Um, so if you're downtown or maybe on East Riverside and you see that bus only lane, even if it's rush hour and you wish you could get into that lane, every time the bus goes by, maybe it doesn't have 70 people on it, but it very likely could have 30 something people in that bus. And so when that goes by, this is how much space we are freeing up with that trip. The volumes get even greater when you start looking at rail. Now, if you're in the audience thinking, well, that's nice, Lonnie, I'd love to bike, I'd love to bus, but it's not gonna work for me, that's okay. You, you could also share the trip because the thing is you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. And so if you can pull yourself out even once or twice a week, that's a huge contribution to what rush hour feels like. And so in that case, if you were to share the ride with somebody, 
once a week when you're going to and from work, that's a 10% reduction in your contribution. If you did it twice a week, it's a 20% reduction. So it, it really does make a difference with small acts like that. So if there's any takeaway you get, it's maybe once a week, try to figure out some way to not be alone in a car like these people are. Now, uh, as we start diving into Project Connect itself, just wanted to put into context of other peer cities. Uh, the investment we made was right here in the middle of the stack. And you can see Los Angeles and Seattle were um, far above us versus Denver, which is you know, another peer city. We, we're pretty much our investment is about in line with that system. Uh, and you can see here, here's Seattle, here's Minneapolis, uh, sorry, uh, Indianapolis with their bus rapid transit system. Here's LA. Um, with their light rail system. So just some things to keep in mind as we're moving forward. So to get to the vision, there's lots of moving parts. Uh, my job today is to give that context and then I'm gonna turn it over to Peter, who's gonna talk more about the urban design elements and some of the things we're considering around the community and we'll need your feedback on. So first, um, again, lots of pieces to this. This is an overall system app. And I'm going to avoid going through every line today with its own slide, but I just want to point out that today we have the red line, that's that commuter rail line going all the way up northwest, and we're proposing doing the same exact kind of treatment heading northeast um, out to Colony Park in this initial investment and eventually, hopefully, out to Maynard and Elgin in the future in future extensions. In addition to that, we have the 801 today, which runs from Tech Ridge all the way down to Slaughter, and Project Connect proposes upgrading that to light rail. We'll go into more detail there shortly. Um, in addition to that, we have the 803 today, which is basically here on the map, but we've got some plans to extend and, and change the route slightly. Um, we're also talking about a line to connect from the airport downtown on East Riverside and across town and eventually joining the orange line up north to 183, that's the blue line. And then you can see there are other purple lines here. We're gonna go into more detail with the Expo line, the Pleasant Valley line, and then other dotted lines that are here because they're all part of future extensions. But something else to keep in mind is that this system also includes nine different park and rides, um, new express routes to and from the suburbs, the expansion of Metro bike as first and last mile service, and then our pickup, um, which is a ride hailing service that uh, you, you never experience surge pricing. The vehicle comes to you in your door and drops you off in a drop zone. And so we've got several of those already out on the street and more of them will be teed up over the next few years. So just to give a little context, you know, right now we've got these on the road, Metro rapid vehicles. They're a bus rapid transit treatment. And we're talking about light rail, which, um, you know, here you can see a three car um, uh, version. We may even be able to stretch to four car at platform on special event dates. So you can see it's a, it's a larger vehicle that we're talking about accommodating. Um, Peter will be talking about what that'll look like on the street. Um, but something to keep in mind about Project Connect. So Project Connect is a program of projects. We voted as a community on a tax, ref, uh, a, a tax referendum to fund that program of projects. They are being designed and delivered by the Austin Transit Partnership. That's that new limited government corporation that was created by the election. In addition to that, Capital Metro is operating that service. So as a project comes online, it becomes Capital Metro's responsibility to operate that system in the future. And in addition, the city of Austin is a critical partner. Uh, and it's not only because of the tax collection and movement over into um, the Austin Transit Partnership budget. But also the city is overseeing the $300 million anti-displacement fund. They're also a critical partner with utilities and right of way and letting us know where the bodies are buried so that if we try to dig somewhere, we know what we're getting into, um, but also looking at what the street network looks like and how it might adjust as we introduce new services around the city. This is gonna take a while. This is our overall program sequence plan. And you can see it takes about 13 years to bring all of it online. Uh, the light rail system, the orange and blue line, take about 10 years. So we're looking at the end of the decade before that operation um, begins. We're, we're here right now. Um, and actually to make this easy, each, this is 2021, 2022, so the numbers are in order. So this is 2029. We're here right now. We're gonna take another year for planning 
uh, then we'll be doing final design and procurement. So construction won't really begin on those lines until 2024. Uh, the red line is a current service and there's a continuum of improvements happening over the years. Um, you may have seen the new downtown station. Also, we're making progress and on some other stations that I'll bring up. The green line you can see is really a 2030s project. So that's further down the road uh, versus Metro Rapid. We're here right now. Um, uh, at least the Expo and Pleasant Valley line will be breaking ground by the end of this year. And then we'll be bringing on other Metro Rapid lines like the Gold Line uh, and the Burnett to Manchaca and Oak Hill line um, shortly thereafter. And we'll go into more detail there. Um, so first, I just wanna mention the red line. Yes, there is progress being made. And in fact, um, we're at a critical point with McAllis Station. That is a new station being planned to serve the Q2 Stadium and some housing and offices that are nearby. These are some preliminary renderings of what we're planning at that station. And in addition, if you pay close attention over the next uh, few months, there should be some announcement about Broadmoor Station, which is just a little north of our existing Kramer Station. When McCalla and Kramer both, uh, sorry, when McCalla and Broadmoor both come online, the Kramer Station will close and we will depend on those two remaining stations to serve the domain and that uh, North Burnett Gateway area. Then there's the Metro Rapid lines. I thought this map might be easier to look at these lines rather than the larger um, uh, system map. So you can see here, these dotted lines again, these are for future extensions. Um, we did not vote to fund these lines yet, even though lines like the MLK and the Crosstown line currently have 15 minute Metro bus service on them. The 803, it's very similar um, to what is currently on the road, but you'll notice that as Broadmoor and McCalla come online and as Burnett Road is improved, uh, we'll be serving directly on Burnett Road rather than turning on and off, like for example, at Pickle, instead of going into campus, we would stay on Burnett Road. Another thing to notice is when you get to the Triangle Station, um, we may not go down the transit mall. We might instead use Lamar and head south. So that would provide new high frequency service on Lamar. We'd zigzag to touch Republic Square. And it's pretty much the same until you get down here. So currently 803 ends at Westgate Transit Center. We're planning to run that service all the way down Manchaca, down to Slaughter, and all the way out west to Oak Hill off 71. Now, you might have heard about a highway construction happening here. Um, so that's going to delay this implementation, but um, this should be on track sooner than that. In addition, if you jump to the other side of town, you'll notice that there's this line here, the Pleasant Valley line, and it connects Mueller down Airport Boulevard and Pleasant Valley all the way to William Cannon before jumping over to Easton Park and Goodnight Ranch with, again, 10 minute frequencies, seven days a week. In addition to that, there's the Expo line starting at the Expo Center. They'll use Loyola, go up to LBJ High, and then follow Manor Road um, all the way down until Trinity. And then it'll use that Trinity Sandjack side of downtown to get to the convention center instead of forcing people like we do today on the 20 to go across town and down to Republic Square to get back over. And then one that may be a little hard to see because it's a dotted line here is the gold line. It connects Highland down Red River and Sandjack Trinity. And when it premieres, it'll be a bus rapid transit service that goes to Republic Square. Over time, we're hoping to update that so that it'll be a light rail service. And instead of ending at Republic Square, it would continue down to South Congress Transit Center. So that's Metro Rapid in a nutshell. And you can see um, what a potential charging station will look like since all of these vehicles will be uh, all electric. And then, uh, we're gonna go into more detail tonight. The two light rail lines is what gets all of the discussion right now for workshops. We've got the orange line and just because it's so long, we have it sideways. So this is the south end and then heading to north end. And again, you can see the dotted line. These are for future extensions from Tech Ridge down to North Lamar Transit Center. And then at North Lamar Transit Center at 183, we have several stations that are in the works heading south by the river to Soco and then all the way down to Stastny. And then again, you can see a future extension down to Slaughter. And this also provides a context of where the blue line would be, not only on Riverside, but again, it would interline with that orange line all the way up to 183. 
In addition, here's that gold line separated. It'll start off as Metro Rapid and then eventually become light rail. And when it does, it will also interline with the orange line down to um, South Congress Transit Center. And then the blue line, just in its own context, from the airport, East Riverside to downtown, across the lake, which we'll talk about in a second, and into the downtown transit tunnel um, until it connects with the orange line. And where are we in this? We are in the middle of a National Environmental Policy Act um, notice of intent. We have been working with the community on NEPA, uh, and we have just completed our 15% design. And we are working towards our draft 30% design. So 2021 was 15%, 2022 is gonna be 30%. And when we have completed that design and cost estimate, our hope is that we can end the environmental impact statement phase and move to final um, and completed EIS. And then hopefully get a record of decision by next winter. So hopefully, um, you know, in a month, maybe uh, 14 months from now, we'll have some very good news, hopefully sooner than that as well. All right, so with that, I'd love to pass the torch over uh, to my colleague, Peter Mullen, who can talk to us more about reimagining the public realm through Project Connect. Thank you, Lonnie. Um, great uh, summary of this very complex and multivalent program of multiple projects. Um, go to the next, please. So I think one of the things that um, is sort of foundational for us in terms of the implementation of Project Connect is that, um, well, obviously it's about moving people um, through all these different modes, light rail, bus, and et cetera. Um, it's also about making places and recognizing that you know, this is gonna be a gigantic construction project um, that we have the opportunity to um, everywhere we go to really look at the public realm, the streetscape, um, neighborhoods where this new transit infrastructure is gonna go and really try to make it the best it can be, right? From a bunch of a number of different perspectives, um, which includes you know, new bike lanes and new sidewalks and new street trees um, and um, other enhancements to the public realm so that you know, we take this very holistic view towards transit. Transit's not just about the vehicle, and it's not just about moving on the vehicle, it's about the environment that is created as the vehicle moves through it. Um, all these things enhance the public experience um, and also will encourage greater ridership of, um, of our transit system, right? And also facilitate intermodal transit. So um, this is a really broad holistic view towards the system, next. Um, we also have a, a, a particular focus on um, designing for those who are disabled or might have mobility challenges, because if we design for those users, we will design for all users. Um, and in certain contexts that can be challenging, but that is kind of a guiding principle. Universal accessibility is one of our, um, our touchstones that we, we, you know, informs everything that we do. Next. Uh, so we're always looking also for in places where we can, where we, we have the opportunity to create really extraordinary places um, that again, interact in many cases with uh, other improvements that the city or other agencies are are um, doing at the same time. So uh, again, looking for how do we combine the transit with uh, public space improvements um, along the way. And I'll talk about a couple of examples of how we're doing that um, next. Uh, we also look at you know, landscape and public art as two very important tools um, in our toolbox for how we enhance the public realm and also I think in a way that is completely consistent with Austin's values, right? So, you know, one of the, the challenges and real, I, I think, um, exciting challenges about this program is obviously it's completely new to Austin, right? We don't, we, we don't have a light rail system currently. We have to, um, we're trying to move people into using transit or a greater number of us using transit more regularly, making that seamless, making that frictionless as part of our daily lives. 
um, but also doing it in a way that stays true to kind of core Austin values, even as we're having this incredible explosive population growth. So um, celebrating art and supporting artists and also celebrating the environment. Obviously a transit system in and of itself is an incredibly powerful uh, tool towards creating a more sustainable urban future, um, but making sure that we actually are, are weaving that into all aspects of the program um, as we do it. Next. So I want to talk about just two examples of how we are using transit um, to enhance our, our public realm. Next. One is downtown. So this is a little snapshot of downtown. You can see the, uh, the Colorado River and Lady Bird Lake, um, the blue line coming in from the east and crossing over the lake and a bridge. We'll talk about that in a second. And the orange line coming from the south and actually going, will be going under the lake in a tunnel. Um, and then they merge at Republic Square and then they head north together. So one of the things about downtown is where a lot of these lines come together, including the red line, which you can see coming into the, it's currently the downtown station um, that will be joined by the green line eventually. And a, a lot of the Metro Rapid lines as Lonnie described also come into this area. So it's kind of this great, terrific interchange of all these different modes, um, obviously a destination for a lot of riders, but also a way for, for people to switch between different modes. And so we're constantly looking at how do we actually make those transfers as seamless as possible. Next. Um, as we started looking at how to design the, the downtown uh, sort of central alignment and the, and the downtown subway um, that unites all these elements, we, we went back to the beginning. Right? We looked at the, his, the original map of Austin, the historic map from 1839, um, the Waller Plan, and uh, which you know, obviously focused on the Colorado River and Shoal Creek on the west and Waller Creek on the right, Capitol to the north, Congress Avenue is the central spine, but also the four historic squares, um, you know, Wooldridge in the northwest, uh, Republic in the southwest, uh, Brush in the southeast, um, and Monroe in the northeast, which has been lost to us. But anyway, we've got these three remaining historic squares, and I think we've identified ways in which we could actually um, tap into that um, fundamental framework and really reinforce it as we go forward as building the, the downtown subway system. Next. Um, we also, it's important to remember that, you know, while rail is new to our recent history um, in Austin, it's not really new to Austin, right? We had an inner city rail um, you know, starting in the late 19th century. Um, and that came right into downtown. And actually there are legacy elements of that that you can see today. If you go to the corner to uh, 4th Street, right at the south corner or south end of Republic Square, you can see the rail embedded in the street at 4th Street. And so um, this infrastructure is was has been part of our history from the beginning um, and so it's actually not something that's new i'll talk about how we're going to bring that back next um, so this is a, a kind of snapshot about how all those greater detail about how all those lines come together red and green coming in from the east um, the metro rapid line weaving its way through that's the purple uh, the blue line coming in from the southeast and then crossing on fourth street um, and then interlining with the orange line on Guadalupe, and then the orange line coming underneath the river um, and then heading up Guadalupe. So you can see 4th Street is really like the hub of the hub. And so there are a number of different uh, stations that are aligned on 4th Street and that are connected by a continuous concourse. That dotted line is, a, um, is the downtown uh, transit hub uh, that connects all those stations, those four stations um, that uh, are sort of spread across that length. Rainy Mac um, down at Cesar Chavez and Trinity Street, um, the what we're calling now Convention Center Brush Square, which is really a kind of a connection between the above grade, the at grade station for the red and green and this downtown on, uh, transit hub underground, um, a new station at Congress Avenue and 4th Street, and then a station at Republic Square. Um, so that's the kind of like large sort of interchange between many, all of the lines coming together. Next. Um, and you can see this is a multi-level system. You've got the street at the top, you've got the trains at the bottom, and then there's this interstitial layer, the concourse um, in between. And that is part of what allows us to facilitate these transfers between different lines um, that are connecting in this, in this downtown concourse. Um, but it also importantly allows us to uh, design this really from the street down. Um, 
you know, the thing about light rail is that you know, the trains want what the trains want. They want to be straight. They want to uh, be flat. Um, so they have a kind of some technical requirements that really determine where they go. Um, and the street wants what the street wants. And so the concourse allows us to kind of basically, uh, you know, accommodate both of those needs. And really from the user point of view, design this from the street down. Again, bringing this holistic urban design lens to the transit infrastructure. Next. So um, again, four street as being this really important transit spine, we also think has the opportunity to become a new pedestrian spine, cutting across downtown, a new green spine that I think complements the north-south spine of Congress Avenue. It's one of the primary streets of, of downtown um, and connecting those two historic squares at either end, Brush and Republic Square. Um, next. So here you can see an image of, of Fourth Street now um, and uh, looking west. And here's an image of what uh, Fourth Street might look like. Now, this is not Fourth Street, just to be clear. Um, thank you, Lonnie. So this is Fourth Street now. This is Fourth Street in the future, but it's not Fourth Street. This is an aspiration of what we might be able to do with Fourth Street. Like, how do we actually make Fourth Street, which is now kind of a back street, to be something that's much more um, pedestrian focused, right? If not pedestrian only, I think we have, we're still studying, you know, what the automobile needs are here, but at least how do we imagine the street so that it's really, you know, humans first, right? And it's consistent with ASMP. And I think, um, you know, adding more retail and programmatic activation and street trees um, as this, you know, as we build in the transit infrastructure, how do we reimagine the street as well? with obviously access to this incredibly robust transit system below grade. Next. Um, one of the aspects at the center of 4th Street at 4th and Congress is the Congress Avenue station. And so this is kind of, I think it's on, will be one of the signature stations of the whole system. Uh, next. Uh, you know, we, again, I like to just go back. This is, we used to have not one, but two, significant train stations downtown, right? Like all great cities, you the train stations are these kind of civic monuments, these hubs of civic activity. Um, and I think we have the ability to actually bring that back to downtown, next. Um, so this is the corner of the Northwest corner of Fourth and Congress, uh, which is currently a parking lot. It's been a parking lot for 50 years. Um, and we think we have the opportunity to do something, you know, some more, something different there, something more significant. So this is a sketch, the concept of creating a, a piece of civic architecture that includes access to the transit below, public programming, um, you know, potentially office floors above, bringing natural light in. Again, I think this was sort of at the corner of Maine and Maine, you know, a piece of significant uh, civic architecture. Next. And there are, you know, great precedents for this around the world. Um, sorry, Lonnie, go back one. Um, this is Denver, obviously a different scale, but you know, the this has been recently revitalized and reimagined with all sorts of public uses. Um, there's actually a hotel inside um, and other public market and restaurants and things. Um, so combining that with the transit uses again to create this great place in the center of the city. Next. And there are some great contemporary architectural examples of this. This is the Fulton Center in New York City. Um, so you just can see how that's been same idea, but it's been translated into a modern vocabulary. So we have to create our own vocabulary for Austin, but we think we can do something you know, really significant and civic in this location. Next. Um, okay, so continuing again downtown, one of the other really signature aspects of the program is going to be the bridge across Labor Lake, right? So um, the subway extends all the way down to the lake, and then it, the, at, when it hits essentially the, the bank of the lake, it merges into a, a bridge that crosses over the lake. Um, and, um, you know, there are lots of different really, really exciting opportunities with this, this um, connection here. So go to the next. Um, you know, the, the connection to the surrounding and talk about connecting surrounding infrastructure, um, the Butler Hike and Bike Trail and one of the Greenway, um, you can imagine you're traveling in the subway and you come out of the ground and you emerge into a garden 
What could not, what could be a more Austin experience than that, right? Um, we think that's a huge opportunity both to you know, benefit riders, but also connect people to these great new public assets that we've invested in um, and the community is invested in next. Um, so you can see um, those, there will be a station entrance to the Rainy Mac station south of Cesar Chavez, at least one, potentially two, um, connecting to the east, to the Rainy Street District, about a four minute walk, um, and also you know, to the southeast, to the Mac, as two examples of destinations. Um, that's about a six minute walk. So really great connectivity to these really um, vibrant centers um, in our downtown. And then, you know, the as I said, the, the subway as it emerges um, from the, at the north side of the lake, transitions into a bridge, um, crossing Leaderburg Lake um, next. And you know, we think that the bridge itself is this really incredible opportunity. Um, you know, we could talk for a whole session about the metaphor of a bridge and what it means for a city and symbolism of you know, stitching together different neighborhoods. Um, and I think it can be a really visible symbol of, of everything that we aspire to the future of Austin to be. Um, and so we're actually gonna, we're working on setting up a design competition, an international design competition um, for that bridge so we can really leverage this opportunity to the greatest possible degree from a design perspective. Next. Okay, so that's one example, a bunch of examples downtown. I wanna talk about another example, which is on East Riverside um, and on the blue line and at the intersection with Clemson Valley, which where we have the opportunity to create a kind of transit center. Go to the next. Um, I'm going to go quickly because I want to have time for questions. So this is the location. You can see that East Riverside kind of highlighted. On the, that's the corner of the blue line um, running east-west and at the intersection of Pleasant Valley, which connects up to East Austin, north of the lake. Next. Uh, this is an important site because it is a place where the blue line intersects with one of our metro rapid routes, the, the Pleasant Valley routes, as well as local routes. And so the idea is how do we actually take advantage of that interchange between those modes to create a really powerful place to enhance the use of the transit, but also to, to benefit the neighborhood. Next. Um, this is a tough site, right? There's a lot of topography on the site, very steep slope, and frankly, a lot of highways, right? We have a Texas U currently. Um, this is a place that currently really feels like it was designed for cars, not for people. So we're trying to kind of reverse that balance or at least equalize the balance through the redesign of this whole interchange, this, ex, ex, um, this intersection, along with the introduction of robust transit as well. Next. Um, let, uh, Peter, I was wondering if you could uh, finish up in the next couple of minutes so we yeah. could take some questions. Yeah, of course. There's Thank also you. a great um, you know, green infrastructure and water quality management opportunity on the site. Next. Um, and connecting to other, again, other assets in the neighborhood, Country Club, Club Creek and Country Club Creek Trail to the east, next. Um, we're currently exploring two different options for how to accomplish that, both of which have different you know, benefits and, and uh, opportunities, next. Um, one option, which is the, um, what we call the blue line underpass option, um, is a great separated option where Pleasant Valley continues across the intersection and the blue line goes underneath it. And we have this kind of extended landscape bridge on either side of Pleasant Valley to facilitate movement across the median. Um, and so that again, we're trying to shrink the perception of the roadways and make this more pedestrian friendly. Um, next, um, you can see a cross section showing how the Pleasant Valley is on that slope above and the, the buses below, I mean, sorry, the blue line below. Uh, next. Uh, this is a rendered view just showing some of that landscape treatment. Next. Um, and then another option which we're, we're studying as well, which is we call the Accra Transit Plaza option, where the blue line is at the same level as the roadway. But in this case, we're actually taking Pleasant Valley and rerouting it around the median um, to create a kind of uh, extended roundabout or avoid about. Um, and that gives us some more opportunities to create a real transit plaza with a dedicated bus lane as well as a ex more extensive landscape treatment. Go to the next. So here you can see a rendered view of that. Um, there will be a dedicated kind of slip lane creating a bus stop for Metro Rapid and local service. They would have a continued dedicated lane around the intersection, direct access between those buses and the Blue Line station. Um, and then this very um, highly performative 
uh, landscape, um, which would both address water quality issues, but allow for cycling and pedestrian connectivity across the median and through the space. So again, integrating transit as well as landscape and um, and public, you know, and alternative mode circulation through the site. Next. And then I'll pass it back to Lonnie to talk about how we can you can stay involved. All right, I, I've been monitoring um, Q and A in the background, and I know that Peter is going to be looking at the ones that are still open. But um, in order to get involved, not only can you participate in a forum like this, we'd invite you to participate in some upcoming ETOD, which is Equitable Transit Oriented Development Study projects that'll be um, popping up in November. So please keep an eye peeled for that. Um, you can also join a working group on the orange line, the blue line, or in the central alignment. And we've broken them into smaller neighborhood collecting areas if you want to stay informed about that. And the best place to go is projectconnect.com slash get involved. You can find updates. Um, not only can you connect to a working group, you can also register for a community design workshop. Our next one is on November 10th at the North Lamar Transit Center. And um, you can see on the website, let me just pull it over, go to projectconnect.com and you go to the Get Involved page, everything is there. So you can see upcoming meetings, um, old virtual houses, here's that working group, um, the community advisory committee, and then all of the upcoming meetings right there at the very bottom, the engagement library. And in there, you can see all the archived presentations and videos from every public meeting that we have hosted over this past year. So please take a look there again. It's at projectconnect.com at the Get Involved tab. And um, with that, I, I think we should um, take it to q and A. I I know we have had um, several questions that have come up. And I wanted to make sure that we got to some of those open ones and we've been answering them. So um, let's start with um, Peter, you might be able to answer. Do you know what other light rail cities we've been looking at as models for identifying best practices? Oh, you're on mute, Peter. We've got some local models, um, you know, at Dallas and Houston. And, and actually, you know, as part of building out this program, we've We've tapped into um, a lot of experts. I mean, people who have come to Austin to work on this program as full-time staff who are come from those other systems and bring those lessons from those systems. Um, you know, obviously Portland is always an example. Denver, um, you know, Seattle has a, sub, has, a, has, a, has a new subway. So that's one that we're looking at, um, but also internationally, right? I mean, I think European cities have really been doing this for a long time. And so they have uh, really great placemaking lessons that we can learn from them as well. Um, I don't know, Anik, do you want to, do you have any other, anyone, anything to add to that? No, except, except that there's a lot of folks at the city who um, have, who are involved with the National um, Association of City Transportation Officials, NACDO. And, you know, we, we routinely um, study and visit and talk to staff in, in other US cities, um, most, most of whom have um, more sophisticated rail and, and mass transit than we do here, or high capacity transit than we do in Austin. And so we, we're bringing that expertise to the table as well. Thanks. Uh, I've got another question here, um, Peter. It's uh, what's the rationale for the Hemphill Park Station in the way that it is? It sounds like there's some concern that it may not be a destination as it is. Yeah, so um, at the at the Hempo Park Station, which is located essentially at the intersection of 29th and Guadalupe. So if you can imagine, that's where Guadalupe takes this very sharp turn between the drag and then the northern section north of 29th. Um, you know, uh, as part of that, that station really is meant to be kind of the, both the northern end of the drag and also serve the neighborhood um, to the north and as well as west campus to the to the west. Um, you know, we've got to do a pretty significant roadway realignment in that location um, just to be able to manage the turn of the of the rail vehicles to get from across 29th and head north. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's gonna have some significant impacts that are, you know, to be honest, not ideal. 
but we also think that we have the opportunity to mitigate them with some new um, smaller public spaces that would be created as part of that realignment of the roadway. So, you know, the, the, um, the, the rationale for the station is really driven by station planning and it's kind of the right spacing between other stations. Um, but it certainly is part of the urban design impacts where we're trying to basically also do some, make that intersection better. Right on. We've had um, a few different questions out. Let's see, this one right here is, um, will roads be expanded or lanes added? Um, I don't know if that Nick, you might want to tackle that one. Um, that is not currently the plan as far as adding travel lanes. Um, you know, we are looking at improving the, the efficiency of all modes as we retrofit rail um, into the urban environment. And so our job at the city is to look at our bike system, our pedestrian system, um, our, our roadway system, our car system, the local bus system as well with Capital Metro and balance all of those and make um, additions to, for any of those modes as necessary. And so we're definitely looking at that right now. I can't think of any plans where we're actually adding capacity um, for cars, but I will say we are looking at efficiencies at intersections, turn lanes, um, addition of protected bike lanes, improved sidewalks, as Peter said, you know, looking at accessibility, of course. Um, and so that's what I can say is we're trying to better all of the systems as we retrofit the rail into the into our environment. Let's see, I've had several questions about this. So I think it's worth discussing here since um, both Peter and Anik are here. Um, and it's the elephant in the room um, from our friends at the rowing club. Um, I know there's been some discussion going on in the background. Um, did you all want to at least um, fill people in yeah. on where we are at the moment? Sure. I mean, Anik, you want me to take that? I'm having. I mean, yeah, I can. Yeah. I can follow up on. on yeah. There was a question about Imagine Austin, but I think you should take it first on yeah. where we're at. So, um, you know, when we were trying to figure out how the blue line would cross the river and get to through downtown, you know, we explored a number of different alignment opportunities. And again, this was you know before the referendum even, um, and really the one that was really only feasible bring, brought the blue line basically aligned with um, Trinity Street. And so unfortunately, there is a conflict there with the existing boathouse structure. Um, and so, you know, we realized that pretty early on, again, a number of years ago, and, you know, initiated discussions with um, representatives of the rowing center to make them aware of this and to kind of um, recognize that this is likely to, to have an impact on the existing boathouse and to also commit that we are, you know, as part of Project Connect, we have to fund replacement if we are going to eliminate or impact the existing boathouse, we have to fund replacement facilities for, for that boathouse. Um, now, this is a part, you know, city of Austin asset. Um, and I know that part is in the process of um, working with the rowing center to look at, you know, alternative sites and alternative facilities and accommodations for the rowing center. Obviously rowers and our rowing community are important to us. So, um, you know, that's, that's a process, but I do want to assure the rowing community that, you know, they're not going to be left out in the cold, right, as part of this process. Um, yeah, that, that, thanks for that, Peter. And, you know, and, and I would say I, I answered the question in, in the chat that, you know, as a growing city, we're constantly balancing and rebalancing our needs because we have, Imagine Austin has um, multiple goals, goals as it relates to the environment and mobility um, and health and, and all the things that um, should be part of a world-class city. And, you know, specifically in the con um, conservation and environment um, policy section of Imagine Austin, you know, it talks about improving the urban environment by fostering safe use of waterways for public recreation, such as swimming and boating that maintains the natural and traditional character of waterways and floodplains, but then right to, you know, that's, that's policy eight. And then policy nine says reduce the carbon footprint of the city and, and its residents by implementing Austin's climate protection plan, which is now Austin's um, uh, climate equity protection plan. It's been updated and developing strategies to adapt to, to climate change. And then following shortly after that, 
in policy 10 is improve the air quality, improve the air quality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions resulting from motor vehicle use, traffic and congestion, industrial sources and waste. So that's just a snippet of policies and, and kind of a, uh, a snippet of what we as city servants, um, you know, have to balance. And so, uh, you know, we are going to try really hard to make both work, to have a place for rowers. Um, I like rowing. I love rowing. I was a triathlete for many years. I love our recreational facilities in Austin. Um, uh, but I also, I also support the fact that we, we need better multimodal transportation. And so I want it all. And my commitment <laughs> is to, is to figure it out. And I hope that the community can come along with us and help us figure it out because we can do it. We can do great things. So that's what I'll add. Thanks for that. Um, By the way, did, add, did, Anique, do you, have you memorized the Imagine Austin policy? Points? <laughs> somewhat, somewhat. Impressive. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know it pretty well. I know that that policies eight, nine, and ten talk about that's the only real really place it talks about boating really as a specific thing. Because imagine Austin is so like fifty thousand foot right view of our city, and then and then our master plans or our plans, the sp the mobility plan, the climate equity plan, our parks and recreation plan for land and facilities gets more detailed, right? And we're constantly updating those. Should be every five years to keep up with the demands, right? And what we know now may not be what we need later. And so that's the job of a planner, so. Uh, well, let's see, I, um, I kind of like the, uh, uh, this last question, because it's the last one in the queue, but also I think it's a nice way to kind of summarize what we're doing here. Um, and I like the folksy way in which it was asked, which is, um, it seems that this project is a day late and a dollar short, um, <laughs> and that, it's really expensive and the middle class are having a hard time even affording the suburbs. So given the rising housing costs, is there some way to expedite this at the same pace that the housing costs are going? So I thought you might um, talk about uh, a little bit, why, why now? And also um, how fast can this project go? I mean, you, you summed it up. I mean, this would have been better and easier and. Um, less expensive 20 years ago when we lost the referendum by how many 1200 votes um, you know but the voters clearly recognize that we we have to do it now and so I mean that's it was pretty resounding um, you know mandate to actually get this done and but you're absolutely right the sooner we can build the system the sooner we can provide these services to the community um, and the people that need the most are the ones that are transit dependent and who you know can't afford um, to have their own car and or um, so you know that's where we take that that mandate seriously right is like how do we get this done and serve the community with this infrastructure you know as quickly as we can right at the same time as we're really taking a holistic view towards its implementation so um, appreciate the comment and you know you're absolutely right and. And uh, it, it, it motivates us every day. And um, Anika, I don't know if you wanted to chime in a little bit, especially because of the housing uh, cost question. <laughs> yeah, are we gonna be able to keep up? You know, we're gonna try. We, we, are, we are doing, you know, our, our city servants, I just got out of um, our city manager's director's meeting that he has once a month right before coming over here. and. You know, it's on it's on everybody's mind. Every department is is really trying to grapple with our affordability and our housing crisis. Um, and so, you know, the good news is, I mean, I, I agree with Peter. It's like we we're gonna we're gonna go as fast as we can. And it, and um, you know, there's so many other what I learned working on the land development code, like there, there's so many other factors, right? It's, it's not just mobility. Um, there's so many other factors that are out of our control um, at local government that contribute to the affordability situation, especially our state laws as that make it really hard to do affordable housing. Um, Peter and I both have lived in New York City where they have rent control, which is a great a great um, tool. We don't have that in Texas. A lot of people don't understand how our state laws really confine us with affordable housing. So 
All that to say, it, um, we're going to do the best that we can. And there's a lot of people who think about this every day and are trying to get ahead of it. Um, but the ball is really heavy and we're pushing it uphill. Um, so I, I just think we need to get it done. And um, I hope that it's going to help. I just want to follow up with that just by mentioning that many uh, there are many costs that impact affordability. And one of them is the cost that it takes to drive. Every time you drive, it costs you about 50 cents a mile. So it really adds up quickly, especially as people are being pushed um, to the periphery. Um, in addition, I just want to put it out there. We're talking about building two light rail lines, four metro rapid lines, and getting started on yet another light rail line and a commuter rail line. And we're doing all of this right now at the same time. Most cities build one line, and then they come back and they build another line. And yeah. They and they build another line. We're trying to do it all at once. So um, while we're 20 years behind, we're trying to make up for lost time in the that in like four years. So uh, I hope you know that, like Peter was saying, there's urgency, and all of us are are really dedicating every moment to making this real and taking it on. And just a plug. Cat Metro Transit is free for the month of October. So hop on a bus. That's great. Or a That's true. Metro. And so uh, uh, this is Kathleen. Again, I want to thank Lonnie, Anik, and Peter for giving such a great presentation. I want to thank my my tech person, Alicia, for doing such a bang up job. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, and most importantly, I'm, I'm please fill out the survey because we want to know what you thought of this and what you want to see for future events, speakers and topics and sky's the limit. And uh, that is in the Q and A box, and I believe we'll also be sending an email. But if you could fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. And thank you again for attending our Imagine Austin Speaker Series webinar this evening. It was a great presentation. Have a great night, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.